Now in chapter 13, well, we're still in this section of learning some of the great principles of life, and they're all given to us here. A wise son heareth his father's instruction. Though Solomon was not David's favorite son, Solomon at least listened to him. And he's an example of a wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. And this man Rehoboam, his son, would not listen. Boy, Rehoboam is really an example for us of the dark side or the negative side here in many of these Proverbs. But there are others that we could find. Verse 2, a man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. There is a type of talking today that is gossip. It's foolish talking. As we've seen before, it borders on the borderline of being risque, of telling things that have a double meaning, this double entendre jokes that even get into Christian circles today. And they begin especially to get on this matter of sex. And I've noticed that many of these folk take courses on sex. My, they've had courses in it. And yet, every now and then you hear of a home being broken up, a husband running away with another woman and all that sort of thing. That's all the result of this type of borderline living. And that's the thing that we are being warned about here, and the young man is told to beware of it. Now we are told here, "...the soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat." You remember Paul put it right on the line for the Thessalonians. There were some pious souls over there say, "...we're looking for the Lord to come," and they quit work. And Paul says, if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. Let's not feed him. You're to work. And if you really believe the Lord's coming, it will make you a worker. Now he says, a righteous man hateth lying, but a lawless man is loathsome and cometh to shame. Righteousness keepeth him that is perfect in the way, but lawlessness overthroweth the sinner. And this is truth in the inward part. That is the background of practical righteousness. And that which is false, God hates it and cannot tolerate it. The child of God should recognize and deal with anything in his life. And this old nature of ours is inclined to lie. It just comes naturally for us to lie. But God says he hates it, and he will have to deal with that type of thing. Now, verse 7, "...there is that feigneth himself rich, yet hath nothing, and there is that feigneth himself poor, yet hath great riches." You know, here again is an example of this old nature that you and I have. If you're poor, you want to put on a front, keep up with the Joneses, and you pretend that you have something. That's the reason that some people today drive a Cadillac automobile. They want to impress folk, and they really can't afford it. They live in a neighborhood that they ought not to be living in. But on the other side, there are people that are wealthy today that are always talking about how poor they are, and yet they are people of tremendous wealth. I used to have a man, a member of my church. He was a very wealthy man. He probably gave less than anyone else always talking about how high prices were and how much this cost him and all that sort of thing, and he'd be broke if things didn't get better, that type of thing. Both of these things are an abomination to God because it's hypocritical. It's putting up a front that we don't need to put up. We don't need to try to keep up with the Joneses, and then we ought not to act like we don't know the Joneses. We still ought to make them our neighbors. And we ought to be just what we are. And now will you notice, verse 8, "...the ransom of man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke." And I must confess, I don't know what that proverb means, and I've tried to dig it out, but I cannot. Maybe you can enlighten me. Now, maybe the person that thinks I'm so ignorant may be able to help me at this point. Now, verse 9, "...the light of the righteous rejoiceth." 
but the lamp of the lawless shall be put out. If you read the history of the kings of Israel, we've already been over that in this first time through in our five-year program of going through the Bible. I called attention to it. There is one line after another that become kings in the northern kingdom, and then they're cut off suddenly and cut off in a violent manner by murder. That's what God says. The lamp of the lawless, it'll be put out. And how that happens again and again in this world today. The end of Hitler was not pretty. And by the way, the end of Stalin evidently was not. Apparently, the doctors had a lot to do with ushering him into eternity. Verse 10, "...only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom." When you find contention in a group, a neighborhood, or in a church, or in a church group, the basis of it is pride, always that. And as someone has said, takes two to make a quarrel, always. Then we have verse 11, "...wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor..." shall increase. Now, we found today again that these Proverbs, here's one, that you've got to look at this in the light of eternity. That's the yardstick you have to put down on this, because many men apparently knew they had very foolish offspring, rich men's sons, and so they've established a trust fund, or they put certain legal chains around their estate that the offspring can't get to it, but they can live off of the income. And today there are many rich men that never made a dime in their lives, to tell the truth. They wouldn't know how to work for a living at all, and yet they are heirs to a tremendous fortune. They just can't lay their hand on it. If they did, they'd spend it all. And we see that this proverb actually would not work in that situation at all. It needs to be looked at in the light of eternity. What are true riches? What really is wealth? Is it those stocks and bonds? Well, the individual is going to lose them someday because death took them away from the original owner. Nobody came in and stole them, but he stole away. He went off and left them. And that's going to happen to those that have it today. Now, verse 12, hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it's a tree of life. Hope deferred. You just keep hoping something that doesn't come to pass. And that's the reason that we ought to be in step with the will of God in our lives, because we hope for a great many things that are not realized at all. And then we have here, "...whoso," verse 13, "...despiseth the word shall be destroyed." But he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understandeth giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. And again, you have all the way through this acknowledgment of God that he hates pride. He hates the lawless. He hates the hypocrite. He has no use for this type of thing that it's in human nature. And that's the reason that old nature that you have and I have. God doesn't want anything that Vernon McGee does in the old nature. It's only what he can do through the new nature that God will accept today. And there's one thing for sure. He's not going to take Vernon McGee's old nature to heaven. And I'll be glad to get rid of it. All of these things that are inherent in all of us, And God makes it very clear. He says in Isaiah 66, 2, "...to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word." And that's the way that you're going to have to come to God if you're going to be accepted of him. You can't come in pride. And then as you drop down into this chapter here, and I just want to lift out now a verse or two. Verse 17, "...a wicked messenger..." falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. The thing today that's been very sad in our government is that we've had men that have had access to government secrets, to that which is top drawer as far as the policy of this country is concerned. And then the man is a homosexual, 
And the enemy finds that out, and he gets to him. Or the man has a weakness for alcohol. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief. And we need men of high integrity in our government today. It is important whether the man drinks or not. I think it's tragic that there's so many men high up in government that use alcohol. I think that is part of our problem as a nation. And we need to recognize that these basic proverbs seem so simple, are so important to our life as an individual and our life as a nation. Now, verse 22, "...a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children." and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Verse 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasten him betimes. And by the way, this is real child psychology. But for the child of God, he's told the same thing. The children are told to obey their parents, but the father is told, Provoke not your children to wrath. That is, don't whip them or discipline them when you are angry or you're talking in a loud voice. Wait till you can calmly sit down with them and talk to them at a time like that. I think that's very important. That is the reason in my life that my father's discipline was so good. He never dealt with me until maybe a day had gone by. And I thought several times I got by with it, but it didn't. Then that time came, and he very calmly dealt with me. And I knew he was not doing what he did because he's angry. We need to recognize that. But discipline is very important. Now we have here this 14th chapter of Proverbs, and we're moving not too fast. We don't intend to because we believe this is an important section of the Word of God. Here you have the wisdom of God distilled into small sentences. And they fit individuals, and they fit individuals that are mentioned in the Bible. They fit individuals that we know, and there's one for us, maybe more than one. Now we have here, "...every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands." And I do not think that he's talking here, of course, about the physical building at all. Now, "...every wise woman buildeth her house." We can think of several, I think, in the Word of God. I believe that Sarah is an example. We're told that she and the other ones that were the wives of the patriarchs built up the house of Israel. And then I would put also Moses' mother here, Jochebed. And you remember that though a slave in a foreign land, she took this little boy and how she watched over him finally became its nursemaid. And she's the one that taught him about the Lord and the tradition that had come down and was coming down then verbally. She was a wonderful mother. She built her house, and though she had no physical house at all. And then we're told, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. And there's several in the Scripture mentioned like that. And the house that they built was destroyed. Let me turn to one in particular. Over in Second Chronicles, the 22nd chapter, verse 2, it says, Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. He reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Amra. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. For his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. And I tell you, the house of Ahab really was brought low. And this proverb is certainly a true proverb. You see, these are things that work in life, have worked in life. There's demonstrations of them. You can take these in the laboratory of life, and they work today. And about us, I'm sure we can see examples Now we're told here, verse 2, "...he that walketh in his uprightness feareth Jehovah, but he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him." And your walk is going to reveal, actually, your relationship with God. This is what we're told in the epistles. "...he that saith, he abideth in him, 
ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. In other words, like the Lord Jesus walked down here, our walk should be in obedience to the Father. You remember Samuel, he laid this matter right out before Saul when he said to him, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Obedience is the important thing. Your religion is phony and false unless there is the reality in the walk down here. This is important. Now we are told here, In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. It's quite interesting. A fool generally gives himself away by his mouth. You just listen long enough and you'll find out. And isn't this a good picture of Goliath? He did a lot of talking, you will recall, and I think regretted it. Now, in verse 4, we have a very remarkable verse. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. This is something that I think is quite amazing. The ox is used in Scripture again and again as an example to us. And the ox was a beast of sacrifice also. Speaking of Christ in sacrifice, and I think also in the wall, the ox was a sort of a servant man. The yoke was put upon him. Our Lord said he had a yoke too. And the question is asked, doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, doubtless, it is written. Now, the ox was a strong animal. And fact of the matter is, he was the tractor and the sedan of the families in that day. They used the ox to ride to market or to town, and they used the ox to plow in the field. Now, the ox was a rather dirty animal. <laughs> you had to clean the crib out. And the way to get rid of cleaning the crib, of course, is get rid of the oxen. And you have a clean crib, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. Now, this has a tremendous spiritual lesson for us. A great many folk try to solve the problems in a church where there's division and where there are cliques and groups. The way to do is to get rid of the certain groups. And sometimes the little clique, are made up of those that are not what you would call good givers, are actually good workers. They're active, they're busy as termites, and probably with the same result. But they want to get rid of the people who insist on having Bible teaching. They insist that things be right and honest in the church. And the little clique doesn't like that. They oppose them. They're very bitter, you see, about it. So they get rid. <laughs> they clean up the crib by getting rid of the oxen. But it's the oxen that are paying the bills. They're the ones that are giving. And they find out that they get in debt. May I say to you, you may have a member of your church. Maybe you don't like him because he's straight-laced. He's insisting that the Word of God be preached. He insists that there be Bible teaching. And you may not agree with him, but you better not get rid of him. If you do, you're in trouble because it's the ox that's going to pull the plow. And there's much increase. He's the one who's going to help you send missionaries to the field. He's going to help pay the light bill. It's pretty important, my friend, to find out who the oxen are around in the Lord's work. Now, I want to be very frank with you. I have a man. He's a very wonderful Christian. He and I have a lot of fellowship together. We play golf together. He lives in a distant city from where I am. And he gives to our program and gives generously. And you know, he disagrees with me about a lot of things. When we play golf, I like to play golf and not have my mind on something else. Well, he always wants to tell me, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? You know, I could get rid of him easy. <laughs> but you know, you don't want a clean crib. I don't mind dealing with a man like that because he's a wonderful Christian. And you know something, and I... I hope he's not listening in. He's right about half of the time. And I find out he gives me some good advice. 
And you just don't want to get rid of the oxen, friends. They're the ones pulling the plow. And that's pretty important. That's a great proverb, is it not? Now, will you notice verse 5 here? A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. Now, that is a very important thing to know. The Lord Jesus has been called a faithful and true witness. And that's the kind of witnesses we ought to be. But there are two kinds of witnesses. There's the faithful witness and the false witness. Now, we are hearing a great deal. Be a witness for Christ. They've got courses today, how to witness for Christ and all that sort of thing. My friend, may I say to you, it's wonderful if you take that course and if you go out and ring doorbells. I can't think of anything that is more wonderful than that. But when you tell somebody that Jesus saves and keeps and satisfies, are you telling the truth? Oh, you say, that is truth. Yes, it is. But do you know it's truth from your life? Or really, are you just being a false witness? Say, these proverbs are tremendous, aren't they? So let's move on down. Maybe we better skip a few of them here. Verse 9, Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there's favor. Fools make a mock of sin. Who did that? Well, Jezebel did that. She's the prime example of that in the Word of God. And we're told that we're to turn away from folks like that and uh, have nothing to do with them. Now, notice verse 10 here. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. Every heart has a secret joy or sorrow, and no one can share that with you. No one. We may try to share it. I know that some time ago, these folk asked me to tell about my operation of cancer. And I was telling them, and I saw immediately when I told about in the hospital how I turned to God and how at that time he made himself real. They didn't like that. And I could see they turned me off. And I said to myself later, after I left them, I said, you know, that's a secret that probably I can't share with anyone else, actually. And you have in your life something like that. Have you ever had some wonderful, joyful experience and you came and attempted to tell it to your loved ones? I remember as a young man, I wrote a poem, (laughs) and I brought it in. And that time my dad had died, and we were living with an aunt, and there were several relatives there. And I came in and I shouldn't have done it, but I said, look, I've written a poem, and I want to read it to you. And I read it, and it brought great joy to me, but it didn't bring any joy to them. They turned me off the minute I started reading it. And the fact of the matter is, it caused me to stop writing poetry. And you don't know, they may have stopped the budding of a great poet, but whatever it was, they sure stopped it. There are things, though, that I'm sure you've learned in life that, You can share with others and things you can't share with others. And then verse 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That is a verse that should be put on many of the cults and isms. They sound so reasonable. They sound so nice. They sound so attractive. Someone said to me some time ago, why is it that a certain cult is growing as it does? Well, I said simply, it appeals to the old nature of man, appeals to the flesh. He just tells you you're a nice, sweet boy, and that if you just brush your hair and change your shirt and take a bath, you are really going to make it because you're such a sweet fellow. And then if you follow certain rules, may I say to you, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. But go down and look at the end. The end thereof are the ways of death, eternal separation from God. And that's pretty important to be in the right one. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. The end thereof are the ways of death. Verse 15, it says here, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. 
And by the way, there are some people very naive. The average viewpoint of a Christian by the world is that he's a person who has a low IQ, that he's naive, and he believes everything that's said to him. Now, a real child of God, and there are only one kind of children of God, and they're the real ones, he's not simple in that sense. He doesn't believe every word. Have you ever noticed that the apostles were constantly questioning the Lord? This man, we call him Doubting Thomas, was constantly raising questions. And Simon Peter was, always raising, Why cannot I follow thee now? Lay down my life for thy sake. And that man Philip, so quiet, and yet he would say, Show us the Father, and that's all we need. And then Judas, not Iscariot, he's bad enough, but the other Judas wasn't too good. He says, how is it you're showing these things to us and not unto the world? These fellows are always raising questions. And if you're a real child of God, you're not going to be gullible. You're not going to swallow everything. Faith is not a leap in the dark. Faith is not betting your life on something. Faith is not what the little girl said. She said, faith is believing what you know ain't so. My friend, faith rests upon a solid foundation. And God says, if it's not a solid foundation, don't believe it. And the simple, they believe with every word. But the man that's prudent, man that's wise, he's going to test it. And the Lord says, taste of the Lord and see if he's good. Then we're told here, a wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. A wise man now, he feareth. Who does he fear? Well, the fear of the Lord. And that's very important. The thing that we need to recognize here, and it's very important to see, is this. And I probably should read several verses here. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. And a man of wicked devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The evil bow before the good and the lawless at the gate of the righteous. The simple here, they have amazing incredulity. They will believe anything if certain ones say it. Someone says that some people believe anything if it's whispered to them. And that is true. And they will accept some of the most absurd things. I'm amazed how some people are taken in. And I'd like to just make this statement here right now. It is not what this preacher says that's important. It's what the Word of God says. And I would say to you, I'm not the oracle of Delphi, and I do not speak ex cathedra. I don't want to assume that at all. I'm not a know-it-all. You test what I say by the Word of God and see whether this is the thing that the Word of God teaches. Don't be taken in, my friend. There's a lot of sweet-sounding speech going on today, both in the church, out of the church, on the radio, and out of the radio. But, my friend, you just don't believe everything you hear. That's very good advice I think I'm giving. Now, we are told here in verse 20, and I drop down here, "...the poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends." How true that is. Today, the poor man can no longer be a rail splitter by the name of Lincoln and run for president. If he lived today, he'd never be able to run for president at all. And you've got to be a rich man. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that is gracious to the afflicted, happy is he. And again, this is a real test of how you feel toward those that can do nothing for you. Are you doing something for them? And then verse 22, Do they not err that devise evil, but loving kindness and truth shall be to them that devise good? How wonderful these Proverbs are. And then let me have now just a high place or two to finish this chapter. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. You know, some people just talk. They don't do. That's all that you get from them. Their doing is talking. Verse 24, The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. Now, the riches here 
are not necessarily material riches. There are a great many folk that are rich, not in the things of this life, but in these things that are spiritual. That is the thing that's important to see. And then a true witness delivereth souls. That's verse 25. But a deceitful witness speaketh lies. The Lord Jesus said, If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. And then we're told, verse 27, The fear of Jehovah is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. What a wonderful thing this is. Now we move on down. Verse 30, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. All of these are wonderful, but I'm just going to lift one out. And that's verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And that is something that is important. I wish that verse was at the United Nations and said they'll beat their swords into plowshares because they're not going to do it until things are right down here. And they'll not do it until Christ reigns on this earth. And then they'll find out righteousness does exalt a nation. But today they don't believe it, but history bears audible testimony to that. The pathway of history is strewn with the wreck and the debris and the ruins of nations that didn't follow this. Sin is a reproach to any people. These are great proverbs that we're looking at in this 14th chapter. We're now, I would say, in the sophomore year of the young man in the College of Wisdom. Now, with your Bible open, and let me read now, Proverbs 15, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Now, I'm sure that the one that comes to your mind at this particular point is Abigail and Nabal. Abigail, a very beautiful, lovely wife and woman, and Nabal, her husband, a fool, but a very rich man. Someone has written a book called Beauty and the Beast, and it's the story of Nabal and Abigail, our Abigail is the beauty, and Nabal is the beast. And you will recall, again, we've seen several proverbs that are applicable to them in particular. You will recall that Abigail, when she heard that her husband had sent an insulting answer to David, who had in kindness and consideration had taken care of the flocks of this man, why, then this girl... This wife, she has the servants get together a great deal of food, and she starts out to meet David. And when she sees him, she goes down upon her face before him and bows before him. She recognizes him as a king, and she speaks of the fact that his life was bound up in the bundle of life with God. What a beautiful, wonderful thing that was. She gave a soft answer, and it did turn away wrath. But we are told grievous words stir up anger. And certainly that was true in the life of these two. Now, you find other illustrations of that as you go through the Word of God. You find that the Lord Jesus now uses the strongest language in the Scripture. You find that, for instance, in the time that he gave that denunciation of the Pharisees in the 23rd of Matthew. That's probably the harshest language in the Bible. That doesn't mean that there isn't a time that it needs, as the old saying is, to put it on the line. And he certainly could do that. But notice how gracious he could be to those that needed the grace of God, that poor woman in sin. Neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. What a gracious thing that was. And you will find in the Word of God again and again illustrations of this in both the 
Old Testament and the New Testament. You find that many gave a, a very gracious, soft answer. And then there are times when it needs to be strong. But now we come to the second verse, "...the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness." Now, here we are back again to the tongue. And I want to repeat again a thing I've said before. I say again, I know I'll say it when we get to the little epistle of James, that there's more said about the abuse of the tongue than there is about the abuse of alcohol. Now, that doesn't mean that we command alcohol. I think that the greatest curse of this country right now is not dope, drugs. I think the greatest curse is alcohol, because today they point the finger at the man that is a drug addict. But the alcoholic, he's sick, and he needs help, and he certainly does. And it's not considered a sin today to be an alcoholic or to be a drunkard. And the Word of God makes it very clear that there's nothing quite as bad as that. But yet, even above that, is this use and abuse of the tongue. It's something that can make you, well, it gives you away. And it tells who you are. And it explains a great deal. I have a book. We're not offering it now. We will when we get to the epistle of James. And the title of the book is startling, but it's a scriptural title. Hell on fire. What is it? Well, it's the tongue. It's a dangerous little instrument. And we'll be talking about that when we get to James. But there's so much said about it here in the book of Proverbs. Now we have here in verse 3, "...the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good." Now, you may look to the right hand and to the left hand, And nobody's watching. Big brother may not be watching you, but God is. God is watching you. Remember Moses, when he went out to slay that Egyptian, he looked this way and he looked that way, and then he slew the Egyptian. Didn't think anybody knew. God knew. The thing is that your life and my life is an open book before God. And what is secret sin down here is open scandal in heaven. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. He beholds the evil and the good. Then verse 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. And here we go again, the tongue. It can be a blessing or it can be a curse to you. The tongue can get us into a lot of trouble. And it can get us out of trouble, too. And then in verse 5, "...a fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent." And there's so much said in the book of Proverbs about listening to advice and instruction. We're living in a day when it is said that you can't tell a fool anything, you can't get through to him for the very simple reason he's not listening to instruction at all. Now, verse 6, "...in the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble." Now, it's not contrasting material riches here at all. The treasure that is in the house of the righteous, there is there so many wonderful things like joy and peace, and there is love, and there is sympathy, and there is comfort. All of these things that are there. And we need to recognize that these things are the things that are the great treasure. And that's the thing that he's talking about here. Now, again, we're changing it a little because it's not the tongue now, but the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. That's verse 7. The wise disperse knowledge. And then verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked 
is an abomination to the low one, but the prayer of the upright is delight. Now, this is a very wonderful verse here. The wicked cannot do good nor think right. It's impossible for them to do that. Notice what verse 26 says. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Now, the thoughts of the wicked, and here you have the sacrifice of the wicked, that which he brings, that which he does. And the reason is that he's wrong. He's wrong inside and outside, and he's all wrong. Therefore, the problem is that he has not learned to come in humility, in recognition of his lost condition, and come to Christ for salvation. Someone has put it like this, a person who trusts so much as a single hair's bread to his works for salvation is a lost soul. And that's true. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Now, he may be religious, He may go to church. He may go through certain formality, but that is no good if the man's heart is wicked to begin with. I don't know why people think if they do religious things, it makes them religious. My friend, your heart has to be changed. God does interior decorating long before he does exterior decorating, and he's not interested in your exterior decorating until he does a job of interior decorating. Now, notice verse 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. Now, we have the sacrifice of the wicked. We have the way of the wicked. And then the thoughts of the wicked. It's an abomination unto the Lord. But he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. And who is made unto us righteousness? It's Christ. There is a belief today. A man thinks, well, if I do it myself, and if a man even trusts in just a hair's breadth, as we've seen in this little man-made proverb, and it's one that is absolutely accurate. Now we find verse 10, "...correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die." A man hates to be told that he's wrong. And you just can't tell some of these folks anything at all. Now, let me continue to move down here. Hell and destruction are Hades, or Sheol here, and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of man? Now, this is another one of these tremendous ones that we have here. And I think that the thought is Sheol and destruction are before Jehovah. How much more than the hearts of the sons of man? And then a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. In other words, the one with whom you and I have to do, we are told all things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do, and that he is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the unseen world, which no man today has seen, and the man of the world does not believe in it. Only God today can make that unseen world real to a child of God, and therefore give him a true perspective of this life. You see, when you live today with the idea that this life is all, your values will change, and certain things will have top priority that, in the case of a child of God, would never have top priority at all. And so it's very important to get a man's perspective of life, of how he's thinking. Certainly, only God can reveal what is on the other side in the unseen world. You and I can't do it, and only the Spirit of God can take the things of Christ, show them unto us, and make these things real. Now, he has passed over today. He walked this earth 1,900 years ago in the flesh. He stepped through the doorway of death, but he came back the third day. 
And for 40 days he revealed himself. And then he went back into glory. And only the Spirit of God can make him real to us. The Lord Jesus said, He'll take the things of mine and shall show them unto you. Now, that's very important to see. And by the way, we need to see it today. Now, verse 13. A glad heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is broken. And it is known that laughter and good cheer and joy actually add to a man's health and the length of his life. It brings in to his life wonderful dimensions that were not there and cannot be there if we live in sorrow and pessimism today. Now we read in verse 14, we're still talking about the heart. You see, we talked a great deal about the tongue. Now we're talking about the heart. The heart of him that hath understandeth seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. Now, he's talking here about the heart of man, not the head of man. And we're talking here now not so much about accumulating certain facts, but that we also be able to have a spiritual discernment, or, as someone has put it, sanctified common sense. And you know there's a dearth of that. There's a famine of that in the land today. And we need to recognize that this is something that is very, very important. Now I'll drop down to verse 16 here. Better is little with the fear of Jehovah than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Now if you want an illustration of this in the Bible, well, It's found in the life of Daniel. Now, you remember he was taken as a slave. He was put with the wise men, and he was to be given a certain diet that they thought would develop him. And he turned that down because that meat was something he would not eat. And he asked for a cereal, actually. If you read that, and we'll see it when we get to it. But Daniel is asking for his Wheaties. And he wants that. Now, this was something that he had, and it was because of his fear of the Lord. He wanted to serve God. And my, how God honored that man. He made him prime minister to the first great world ruler and made him prime minister to the second great world ruler and the second great world empire, Cyrus the Great, so that God honored this servant of his. Now we have here in verse 18, "...a wrathful man stirreth up contention, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife." And that takes you back, of course, to the very first verse that we had, and a very important verse, by the way, that a man that is crude and rough in his dealings, why, he will stir up strife. And now, again, remember the Lord Jesus was the most controversial person that's ever been on this earth. And where the truth is preached, there's going to be trouble because the ones that don't want to hear it. I've said this before. I want to repeat it again because I believe that the Word of God's like a Geiger counter. You just start running it over a congregation and you'll find out who's genuine and who's not. It doesn't take you long to do that. I said to a young preacher, he said, I was having trouble. I said, I tell you, you preach the Word of God. And I said, you give out the Word of God, the light of the gospel. And when you do that, I said, you'll find two things are going to happen. Always does. Now, when the light is given, and I told him, I said, when I was a boy, I used to have to go out the barn at night and feed sometimes the horse or the cow. And I said, I'd light a lantern. And I'd go out there, and I said, the minute that you open the barn door and step in, the rats will all run for cover. And the birds that are roosting up in the rafters, they begin to sing. Light has two effects, you see. The rats will run for cover. And so when you give out the Word of God, you're going to see two things happen. But we need to recognize the fact 
that we do not need to exaggerate the fact that the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ today is an offense. We don't need to exaggerate it. Just preach it. And that, I think, is the important thing to keep in mind and the thing that he is saying here. Now, let me drop on down here in verse 20. We're told that a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. You see, a father brags of a boy if he's making good. If he's not, you won't hear a word out of him. Verse 21, Folly is joy to him that is destitute of heart. But a man of understandeth walketh uprightly. Now, verse 23, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. You know, it's not only what you say, but when you say it, that's important. Sometimes just the right word at the right time will do the job. May I say, and many of us, if we would testify today, could tell you that The right word was said at the right time in our own lives that changed our lives. And that certainly happened to me. Verse 26, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Now, we've seen that before when we considered the sacrifice of the wicked and the way of the wicked and the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. The wicked has to be turned from his wicked way. And he has to be turned to God. Now, I drop down to verse 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. And I wonder if you recognize that in the Word of God, Peter says this, that he hears the prayer. That's interesting. Of the righteous, but his ears are closed to the prayer of the wicked. And God makes that very clear, friend. The Lord's far from the wicked. He heareth the prayer of the righteous. Verse 30, The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. I tell you that one of the best ways to lose weight is to get a bad report, is to hear bad news. And then the last one, verse 33 in this chapter, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, And before honor is humility. Coming with humility to learn of God, to bow before him, that's the important lesson for man to learn. Now, back to the 16th chapter of Proverbs. This is a very rich section, and I don't want to get bogged down, but it's very important, I think, these sententious sentences drawn from long experience. Short sentences from long experience, tested in the crucible of time and of suffering also, and made rich and real by the power of the Holy Spirit for us today. And Proverbs are for all time, although they were written to the young man specifically that was an Israelite under the Mosaic Law. But It widens out and speaks to all of our hearts in a very definite way. Rich and poor, male and female, black and white, it pays no attention to that. This is a book that can reach down and touch us. Now, it opens chapter 16, verse 1, like this. The purposes of the heart are of man, but from Jehovah is the answer of the tongue. I think that probably our human proverb that would go along with this is man proposes, but God disposes, and reveals the fact that, as the Word of God says, it's not in man that liveth to direct his way. He may plan, and you and I may plan and arrange things, but I tell you, when the time comes to speak or act, God is the one that is going to have the last word. And he is the one that the answer must come from him. We may make great boats, but only God can give us the answer. Now, verse 2, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but Jehovah weigheth the Spirit. And here again we have an example of that 
and it's been stated in many ways before we've seen it, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. The thing that any of you that have dealt with lost people and have spoken to them about their salvation, or you've been a preacher or a teacher, you know that the answer that you get most time is, I don't need to be saved. A man's clean in his own eyes. I've had that thrown back at me, hurled at me as even a challenge. Why, I'm all right. What is wrong with me? I'm willing to stand before God. I'm an honest man and that sort of thing. And there are a great many Christians. They think that their walk is perfect before God. And the whole problem is wrapped up in just this one verse of Scripture. It's found over in 1 John, the first chapter. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Now hold up the mirror of the Word of God to your life, and it'll reveal things that are not quite right, that you haven't measured up to God's standard. You may measure up to the standard of the Chamber of Commerce, and they may make you the man of the year. They may reward you and give you a plaque in your club that you're a member of. Your church may even pat you on the back. Your neighbors may say that you're a great guy. But my friend, when you see yourself in the light of the Word of God, then you see that you have a need. You see that there's spots there. You see you've come short to the glory of God and that your way may be clean in your own eyes, but not in God's eyes. Because if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, John says, and do not the truth. Now, he's speaking to Christians. Well, I think there are a great many folks sitting in a church pew as comfortable as you please. In fact, they point their finger at other folk and say, look, They're not so good. (laughs) I am. I'm really all right. fact of the matter is, some of the saints today have asked God to move over. They want to sit next to him and look down and judge their fellow Christians. And there are a lot of folk in the world that feel like that they can do it themselves. But the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. But it's Jehovah who weigheth the spirits. God searches you fact, the matter is the law was never given. There are many folk that have so misunderstood what we said in Galatians. They say, you say that the law is no good today, that the law is inoperative. I didn't say that. If you listen very carefully, you would have heard me say that the law can't save you because the law is good. Paul said it's good. It's a mirror. It reveals to you you've come short of the glory of God. And my friend, if you look at the law of God and then you still say you're measuring up to it, you haven't seen the law yet. You really don't know what the law is really saying. The law demands perfection of you. And you and I can't produce it. Therefore, you and I need a Savior. And that's what the law will do. It's the schoolmaster to bring you to Christ, take you by the hand and bring you to the cross and say, little fella, what you need is a Savior. You need a Savior. That's what the law says. Law's good, but not to save you. It can't save you. And if you're going to go around and take the position that this proverb says, the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, and even with the Word of God before you. May I say, there's none blind like those who will not see. Because remember, Jehovah weighs the spirits. And have you ever seen a pair of scales that can weigh spirits? Well, I'll tell you one, the Word of God. It's a mirror, it's a pair of scales to measure you, and it says you've come short. You didn't measure up. Well, we'd better move on. These Proverbs are, oh, they are terrific, friends. Now, verse 3, "...commit thy works unto Jehovah, and thy thoughts shall be established." Now, the word here, commit, is a very interesting word. It could be rendered... Roll, 
you know, just roll your affairs over upon the Lord, and he'll take charge. In fact, that's actually the way that I got saved, because I ran away to Detroit, got in sin, came home, and my, how my conscience bothered me. And then a preacher told me that being justified by faith, we have peace with God. God wasn't mad at me that he bore my sins. And so there are many times even to this good day that at night if I can't sleep, I like to just roll over and just say, Lord Jesus, I'm resting on you. Just roll over. (laughs) Rest in him. Commit thy works unto Jehovah. Commit the whole thing. Many of you right now worried about tomorrow, next week, next year, about the future. How's this going to work out? I'm doing this. How will it work out? Well, why don't you just turn it over to him? Roll it over on him. How wonderful it is. And what a picture this is. Now, in verse 4, we have, Jehovah hath made all things for himself, yea, even the lawless for the day of evil. And my friend, here is strong medicine for you. I tell you, here's a pill that'll send you on a trip. And I mean a trip. Jehovah hath made all things for himself. Have you ever wondered why that the ocean is salty? And why will you have a tide? We say, well, it's according to certain laws. Who made the law? You know why the ocean is salty? Because God wanted it that way. The Lord Jesus was the creator, and he wanted it that way. Somebody says, well, that's due to a certain law that the land has been filtered, the salt has made the ocean that way. By the way, who put the salt in the land to begin with? A very interesting thing is that I don't care what you do with evolution. You go back to a time when you've got to have somebody make something to get the thing started. (laughs) You know who started it? God did. And not only that, he made all these things for himself. What today is the chief end of man? Well, I learned that in the catechism a long time ago, and it's good. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, I don't care who you are today or wherever you are, God created you for his glory. Somebody says, what about that drunkard in the street down there? What about that crooked man today? And I won't identify him any more than that. Somebody will say, you're picking on that group. Well, I'm not, but you could find crooked men in a whole lot of groups. That lost man, what about him? You mean he's for the glory of God? My friend, this is a strong pill. Are you ready to swallow it? All of that is for the glory of God. Somebody says, I don't like it. I don't remember he ever asked you whether you liked it or not. He never asked me whether I liked it or not. And very frankly, there are certain things I don't understand, and I could make some very fine suggestions to the Lord. But the Lord says, Vernon McGee, I didn't make this universe for you. This universe exists for me, and you exist for me. And you're going to be for my glory, whether it'll be for good or bad. Whether you are saved or lost, God's accomplishing his purpose today. My friend, don't you think it's about time you got in step with God? He's the one running the thing. A great many people want to make sure they're going with the crowd, going with the thing that's popular, going with the thing that's going to work out. My friend, I don't know how things are going to work out in this world, but I do know this. Ultimately, it's all going to be for the glory of God (laughs) and even the lawless for the day of evil. God's going to make the wrath of man to praise him. You say, how? I don't know. Let's wait. He'll show us someday. Are you willing to trust him and commit your way to him and get in step with him? The very wonderful thing is that God's moving this universe according to his plan and purpose. The Greeks had a proverb that went like this, the dice of the gods are loaded. And that's exactly what God is saying to you today. Now, whether you like it or not, 
God is saying to you, don't gamble with me. Don't act like I don't exist. You can play house like I don't exist and that this is your universe and you're going to work it out your way. But I want you to know that if you start gambling with me, you'll lose because you see, this is my universe and I make the dice come up my way, not your way. My dice are loaded. (laughs) I already know how they're coming up. You don't. So the thing to do is to get in step with God. A man, the Scripture says, he's a fool that live without God. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. My, this is a, oh, this is a pill, is it not? And it's one that's hard for men to swallow. Now I'm going to keep moving over here. We find in verse 7 a proverb that I've wrestled with a great deal. It says, When a man's ways please Jehovah, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now, I've come up with several answers to this. The fact of the matter is, I have searched what other men have had to say on this, and it's been quite interesting. You mean to tell me that if your ways pleased Jehovah that you wouldn't have an enemy? Well, if that were true, then God wouldn't have an enemy, and he does have an enemy. But this is the position. If your ways please Jehovah, then your enemy may hate you. And by the way, he will hate you if your way pleases Jehovah. And the interesting thing is, these folk, when the chips are down, will admit that God is using you. That's the important thing. The nicest thing that's been said about me in Southern California was actually said by a man who very frankly says he hates me. He says, I hate him. But he says he teaches the Word of God. (laughs) I say, thank you, Mr. Enemy. You are carrying out this proverb. You have to make that kind of an acknowledgement if you're honest in your statement. I love the proverb, by the way. Now, that's my interpretation of it. Now, we have here many very wonderful things that are coming up, and I'm inclined to pass over some of these in order to lift out some that we believe are very important. Let me come to verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. I have that underlined in my Bible. Better is it to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Now, here again is a thrust that's made at that which God hates, pride. That is number one on God's hate parade, and he says he hates it. That is the thing that brought the archangel that we know as Satan. He was Lucifer, son of the morning. Probably the highest creature God created until sin was found. What was the sin? It was pride. He tempted to lift himself above God because he was such a great creature that God had created and he'd given him this power of free choice, which is a tremendous thing. I think that was a very dangerous weapon God put in the hands of some of his creatures. Now, some of them, you take the ducks, they follow an instinct. When it's winter time, they leave Canada and they winter down in South America. And in summertime, why, they summer up in Canada and back and forth they go. And they do it because they're moved by instinct. But man has a free will. A man can stay in Canada in the winter time. I don't know why he would. And he can go south in summertime. And again, I don't see why he would do that. And so you have here this awful thing known as pride. And this is the thing that was the undoing of that man Haman in the book of Esther. I have a book on Esther, as many of you know, and many of you have it, because we sent out quite a few of them when we were studying the book of Esther. And then there is the story. There's so many in Scripture that illustrate this matter of pride. Absalom, 
Imagine him rebelling against his father David. And then there was Goliath, the giant, filled with pride. Ahab filled with pride. All of these 